church in Philadelphia right? These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Spirit would open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word this morning. Increase our trust in the Lord Jesus and keep us trusting in him. Amen. Mm -hmm. Do you feel weak? Over the last few weeks, we've been reading these letters from the Lord Jesus to the churches. We've heard some challenging things, and Jesus hits hard with some of the failures of the churches that he identifies. And maybe some people are feeling, I've heard that, I've been hit by that, but I do love Jesus. I, I don't want to listen to false teaching that contradicts his word. I don't want to tolerate that dishonor to him. I'm doing what I can to help others to take him seriously. And I, I won't go along with our society's sexual standards as I want to honour Jesus in everything and keep paying attention to him. But I'm tired. Life is hard. You feel like that? Maybe you're feeling people are giving me a hard time for my Christian stance so sometimes I wonder if it feels worth it. I'm not achieving very much. I don't seem to have much influence on others. People just laugh at me or ignore me. Am I good enough for Jesus? I feel such a disappointment. I don't want to disappoint Jesus, but he must be disappointed in me. And what's, what's he going to hit me with this week? 
What's this week's critique going to be from the Bible? And it may be that some people here just need to hear Jesus' word of affirmation and encouragement. You're on the track. Don't give up. Just keep going. Well done. And that's how this letter to the church in Philadelphia reads. There's no condemnation for them, no complaint against them. Pure encouragement from Jesus, but with more substance and reasons to keep going than uh, what I was saying we might feel that we need to hear. Remember who Jesus is, the one that John saw in the vision of chapter one. Do you remember we read about this awesome <laughs> brightness, the dazzling splendor of the risen Jesus in the vision with all those symbolic things that John saw that have been echoed in each letter so far in the description of the reminder of who it is that's speaking, who's writing to these churches. And today's letter starts again with, with a characteristic of Jesus. I don't think this is drawn from the vision in chapter one. Uh, it comes from elsewhere in, in the Bible. And that is, he's the one who holds the king of David. He's the one who is holy and true, verse seven, and he holds the key of David. Being given the keys can be a, a sign of authority and honor. And I remember when I was licensed to this parish, this benefits a few years ago, and that, that licensing service being ceremonially given the keys. And somebody might be given the keys of the city as a, a recognition and uh, sign of authority and honor. The key of David is, is, is that. You might be, might have triggered a memory of the Christmas carol, Advent carol, and come, and come, Emmanuel. So I've been thinking of that. One of the verses, which maybe we miss out sometimes because there are so many verses, uh, oh, come thou, key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Where does that come from, that idea? Well, if you were paying attention this morning, you heard it in the uh, Isaiah reading. I think that's the only place in the Old Testament that the key of David is mentioned. David, of course, is the great king of Israel, and it's his descendants that God had promised would always be on the throne of Israel. So the dynasty, the house of David, um, produced all these kings. And one of his uh, descendants, was king when the prophet Isaiah said this thing, um, Isaiah 22, 22, that we heard, I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David, where he opens, no one can shut, and when he shuts, no one can open. Jesus is quoting that in Revelation. And it's not originally about the king himself, it's about a <laughs> Eliakim, king, who's given the job of steward in the palace, uh, and uh, it's the job that he's to take over from Shebna, his predecessor, to whom this is spoken. And uh, verse 20, in that day I'll summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I'll clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. Now, we don't know, I don't think we can know much about Shebna or Eliakim, except that they were both in the envoy sent out from besieged Jerusalem to talk to the Assyrian field commander who was uh, about to attack the city and before God miraculously rescued his city. But the point being made about this key of the house of David is that the steward, the holder of the key, lets people in and out. He's in charge of the household. And that's the position that the Lord Jesus is claiming for himself as the fulfillment of these words that are, are foreshadowed in a small way by those palace stewards. 
On a Saturday night in our house, most of us, uh, we generally go to bed at roughly the same time, but on a Sunday morning, I tend to get up significantly earlier than the rest of the family, and then I have the earlier service at Claverton. And so uh, last night, before I went to bed, we had the log burner going, it was lovely and warm in the room, and not so warm in the rest of the house. So I made a point of leaving the living room door wide open so that the heat could sort of drift through as the I carried on burning for a bit when we all went to bed. And this morning when I got up over and else was in bed, I was surprised to find that door was firmly closed. Frustrating that what I did didn't have any significant, any lasting impact. But it just reminded me of these words that what Jesus opens, no one can shut. And then realizing how frosty it was this morning, our chickens couldn't drink their water so uh, before breakfast I was out probably nobody else would notice that they, they wouldn't get it to laugh at church otherwise I was thinking where is it how sunny it would be so uh, went to the shed to get there drinking the, the padlock on the shed door was frozen so then I'm messing around with the flame on the key to get the padlock and again it reminded me of what Jesus is saying about himself in verse 7. He doesn't have any of these problems. He is firmly in control. He holds the key. He's the one in charge of security. If he says you can come in, you can. If he says you can't come in, you're outside. So, the fact that Jesus is the key holder is an encouragement to these Christians in Philadelphia, who are trusting in Jesus, that their place is secure in him. And what they need to do is keep trusting Jesus. Stick with him. Don't give up on Jesus. Don't move on to some kind of post-Christian state. Stick with Jesus. There are various items in this um, reading to hang our thoughts on. We've had the key then there's the door, there's also going to, going to be a seat, a crown, a pillar, and a city. The door in verse 8, as well as the door being what the key goes in, an open door symbolizes not only access and welcome, but opportunity. An open door might be closed. Jesus talked many times in his parables when he was urging people to enter through the narrow door, that this door into God's kingdom was open, but one day he was going to close it. And having come to Jesus, the Christians in Philadelphia are all here trusting in Jesus. After through that door, and he holds open Another door of opportunity, he says to them uh, in verse 8, see, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you've little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. The door of opportunity is something that, that crops up quite a few times in the New Testament. So, Paul writes to the Colossians in Colossians 4 verse 3, pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. Paul was writing that from prison and he wanted a door to open. You might think the obvious thing is he wants the prison door to open so he can get out of that unpleasant place and be free. But his concern is that the word of God is not chained and wants a door to be open for the message to get out, to, to reach people so that they can know Jesus is risen from the dead, he's Lord, and he's offering life and invitation to forgiveness and being part of his people. That's what Paul saw again and again. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, a great door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12. I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ 
and found that the Lord had opened a door for me. The Lord opens doors and gives opportunity for his word to go out to more people. And he had given these Christians in Philadelphia an opportunity. He'd opened the door. No one else was going to close it. No one was going to stop those Christians hearing, uh, telling others about Jesus and people that God was bringing to himself, hearing and responding to the invitation. And so they're to keep going. It's another reason to keep going. Jesus is holding the door open. He gives us opportunity. Dan Max is an opportunity in Hong Kong where it looks to all the world as though the doors are closing there. But we've seen this before in China. All the missionaries were thrown out halfway through the last century and most people thought that was the end for the church there. And actually, God kept the door open and caused his gospel to spread within China. And there are millions and millions of Christians there holding on to Jesus. And he gives us opportunity in our lives as individuals in our workplaces, in our families, with our neighbours. He's given you an opportunity. He's given you one person that you can help and serve and share the love of Jesus with. Of course you can. Maybe you have a bigger opportunity than one person, but don't despise and underestimate the opportunity that helping one person might be. The encouragement to us from this open door is that Jesus gives opportunities, but nobody else can prevent. And so let's keep going. Don't stop talking about Jesus. Don't go quiet. Keep bringing others to him. Then the seat of power. Another reason not to give up. The seat itself isn't mentioned here. I made that up to make it fit with the rest of the thing. But the point is Jesus is in the seat of power. It's very clear from this passage that Jesus is the one holding the power. No one can shut the door, verse 8 and verse 9. He will make opponents recognize. Have a look at this maybe slightly troubling or puzzling verse 9. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they're not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Let's be clear that the Bible is not anti-Semitic, and we mustn't be. The Lord Jesus was a Jew. All of his first followers were Jewish. And at first, everyone thought that to be a follower of Jesus, you had to be Jewish. And then it became clear, as Jesus is Lord over the whole world and over all people, Others who were not Jews were hearing and believing Jesus risen from the dead, wanted to put their trust in him, follow him. So what? do they have to become Jewish first? No. Not in that cultural sense. They just need to trust Jesus. And so the church started to be made up of Jewish and Gentile people following Jesus. Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And so uh, some of the Jewish people who did not accept Jesus didn't like this. They threw the Christian Jews out of the synagogue. They tried to prevent them speaking about Jesus and, and inviting non-Jewish people into God's people. And so Jesus has strong words about them and the synagogue of Satan. 
people denying Jesus, claiming to be Jews, so they're not, but are liars. And the point is that Jesus is in control, and one day, even those opponents of Jesus will recognize. And this is going to come in a way that might look like a reversal of what they're expecting of the Gentiles, because it had been prophesied, the hope of Israel had been from Old Testament times, that all the nations would receive God's light through Israel and would come to Israel to ask them for blessing and to come to God there. This could be submitting, uh, recognizing that they're right, submitting because they're defeated. <coughs> it could be, verse 9, falling down at your feet and acknowledging that I have loved you. It's not the end of the story. It means turning them to receive that love as well. Recognizing, yes, Jesus is right. And you want to submit and trust him and people to come before it's too late for the door of opportunity closes. And Jesus being in control will protect his people even through great testing and suffering. Everyone's going to go through hard times in verse 10. But God's people who keep his command to endure patiently, holding on to Jesus, will be kept through that. So how do we how can we keep going? If we've we've seen reasons in the key and the door and the seat of power to keep going, well the answer is in verse 11, hold on to what you have. Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. What we have is Jesus. Only Jesus. Hold on to him. And then what? We have a rock solid future. A crown, a pillar, a city. The crown symbolizes victory. So the, um, a medal winning athlete wouldn't have a medal hung around their neck, but they have a crown put on their head. And we, No one will take that from us. We hold on to Jesus. And a pillar is what we will become. He promises to the Christians in Philadelphia and to us. Verse 12, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. A secure place, a rock solid future in God's presence. And a city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. This is what we're looking forward to. The great hope and eternity of God's presence with us is not so much going off to heaven when we die, but heaven coming to earth and God's dwelling being with his people and that's unpacked more later on in Revelation uh, and what we can look forward to if we hold on to Jesus so don't give up don't turn from Jesus but hang on and he will hold on to us as we Father God, we praise you for exalting Jesus to the highest place, giving him the authority and power. And we thank you for his great love and for the privilege of experiencing his love and mercy and forgiveness. So we pray that we might never take that lightly or turn from it. But keep us holding on to him and honouring him 
as the Lord in every way. Amen. Amen.